Okay, um, so what we'll be talking about today is what I call practical conservation tillage uh, for organic and transitioning farmers. And uh, this is definitely a challenge because uh, continuous no-till in annual cropping systems is really not feasible without the use of herbicides. And the only herbicides that are permitted for organic growers at all are really not cost effective on a uh, field or even market uh, garden scale. <clears throat> so um, organic farming, of course, is based on healthy soil. It's been the kind of the founding principle since the beginning of the organic movement in the mid-20th century. And this was codified by the National Organic uh, Rule adopted in uh, 2002 uh, under the USDA Organic Certification Program. And one of the um, standards is that the organic producer must select and implement tillage and cultivation practices that maintain or improve the physical, chemical, and biological condition of the soil and minimize erosion. So what you have here is a cover crop that's just been mowed and the uh, grower is tilling it in with a, a rototiller, a, a very common uh, tool in the uh, farming uh, community. And the question is, yeah, we're feeding the soil, but what will the, uh, the rotary tillage do to uh, soil health, especially the physical condition? Okay, here we go. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, <clears throat> so we all know that when you till the soil, you have impacts on those physical properties. Um, for one thing, most of the time when you till the soil, you also expose the soil surface. That increases risk of erosion. And when the rain comes down on an exposed uh, bare soil surface, it tends to crust. And then the, the temperature swings near the surface of the soil are widened, uh, and that can have impacts on the soil life. Um, in the photo, you can see what's happening is the soil is a little dry and the weather's a little windy, so there's actually wind erosion being caused by the tillage pass. And uh, also what happens is um, both the exposure and the breaking up the soil advocate, uh, ag aggregates um, results in the oxidation of soil organic matter. And soil organic matter, of course, is a, is a basis of uh, long-term soil fertility and quality. <clears throat> So uh, there are also some impacts on soil biology. Uh, one of the things that the tillage does is like a stimulant. It stimulates microbial respiration, uh, speeds it way up. And in fact, uh, there's an interesting uh, meta-analysis of 62 different studies that showed that not only did tillage tend to increase soil respiration, but it increased the amount of respiratory carbon dioxide release per unit microbial biomass. So you have less efficient utilization of soil organic uh, resources by the soil life. As a result, two things happen. Nutrients are released, which uh, promotes crop growth, but then uh, organic matter is consumed. And then when you end the living cover, you, you uh, for at least a time being, you're interrupting the flow of root exudates. And it's the exudates and the sloughing of fine roots that are kind of the bread and butter of soil microbial nutrition. That's just sort of like their staple source of sugars and other um, nutritious organic substances on which they live. And if you do something like plowing, you do a moldboard plowing or heavy disking, you're inverting the soil profile. So you end up with the most biologically active surface layers under um, flipped underneath some of the less active uh, subsurface layers. And uh, one of the most uh, well-known and serious negative consequences of tillage is breaking up fungal networks in the soil. And it's the um, soil fungi that play a really central role in long-term soil health and fertility. So um, <clears throat> the Organic Farming Research Foundation conducted a survey in 2015 of um, well over 1,000 farmers. In fact, it was about uh, 1,400 farmers who participated. And nearly three quarters of them cited soil health and quality as a research priority. Two-thirds uh, mentioned specifically weed control, and two-thirds also mentioned fertility and nutrient management. And many of these farmers particularly wanted to learn more about the effects of different tillage practices on soil health, fertility, and the accumulation of soil carbon, as well as um, impacts on the weed community, since uh, weeds are a major challenge in organic agriculture. Well, in all agriculture, but specifically in organic. So I'm going to step back for a little bit and 
<clears throat> look at the overall history of no-till, where it came from. In the 1930s, the Soil Conservation Service, which is now the Natural Resources Conservation Service, or NRCS, was established in response to the Dust Bowl, which is this catastrophic soil erosion event that occurred during drought and was traced to excessive plowing and tillage of those um, semi-arid zone soils. So the Soil Conservation Service um, launched a number of efforts to reduce the erosion through uh, reducing tillage, uh, plowing on contour, planting windbreaks, and when practical, cutting back on tillage. And beginning in the 1970s, um, a growing number of farmers have actually adopted uh, no-till systems or conservation tillage where they greatly reduce tillage, relying on herbicides instead of the plow and other tillage implements to manage uh, weeds and uh, cover crops and to prepare seed beds. <clears throat> As of 2012, about 34% of U.S. cropland was managed no-till and another 28% was managed with conservation tillage, which NRCS defines as any tillage system that leaves at least 30% of the soil surface covered in residues. In other words, instead of creating a clean seed bed, you're at least leaving some residue on the surface, um, which reduces the uh, impacts of raindrops and, and sun, um, and also reduces both wind and water erosion. And then in the last 10 years, uh, there has been an approach called conservation agriculture, which integrates um, uh, the continuous no-till, like tilling as infrequently as possible with the use of high biomass cover crops whenever there is a cash crop not planted. Uh, and one thing I want to point out is of those uh, 170 million acres or over half of U.S. cropland that was under some form of conservation or no-till, only 10% of those acres at that time were planted to cover crops. Um, although uh, the SERI, the annual SERI cover crop surveys has shown a very steady increase in the use of cover crops and a lot of positive feedback from farmers on their effect on soil health and on maintaining or even somewhat increasing crop yields. So um, that proportion is increasing, but there are still many millions of acres that are no-tilled without cover crops. But conservation agriculture takes it a step further and includes high biomass cover crops, diversified rotation, keeping the ground covered as much of the year as possible, uh, using organic amendments uh, for soil health, and then using just those synthetic inputs that are needed for, to maintain fertility and weed control. Uh, so it's a very integrated approach. It's not organic, but it is a very integrated approach. So in organic systems, um, continuous no-till is really not practical unless you're growing apples and have established a um, uh, grass legume sod underneath that you're managing by mowing, you're talking about a perennial crop, you can do no-till or pasture. But if you're trying to grow a rotation of uh, vegetables and or annual grain crops, it's really not practical. So there are a number of other strategies that organic growers use. Uh, these include rotational no-till, which we're going to explore in some greater depth in the next few slides. Um, and then there's also simply using non-inversion tillage in lieu of the turn plow and heavy disc. Um, you can also just till shallowly. Sometimes you don't need to churn the whole top six inches of the soil. You can go two or three inches, get enough of a seed bed and enough weed control. Another excellent strategy is strip tillage or ridge tillage, where you're basically working up just a crop row. And uh, we'll explore that also later in greater depth. In the picture, this is a small um, farm that served a community-supported agriculture um, membership. And one year, she just mowed down the rye cover crop and tilled with a walk-behind um, rototiller, just a two-foot wide strip to set those tomatoes out so that two-thirds of the field uh, remains undisturbed. <clears throat> also, another area where organic growers are challenged in the area of soil disturbance is uh, managing weeds. And uh, if you do a uh, take an ecological approach to weed management, organic IPM, uh, IPM for weeds, you'll reduce the frequency and intensity with which you need to cultivate to, to keep those weeds at, at bay. And there will be another, uh, there was another uh, webinar on weeds earlier this year. It has already been archived. Uh, it goes into that in more depth. Uh, another way to till the soil is biologically. There's some cover crops that literally uh, subsoil for you. And finally, 
um, one way to relieve the effects of that tillage which is necessary is after several years of intensive production to rotate your field into perennial sod for a couple of years. That really restores a lot of the soil health that has been perhaps compromised by tillage. So for rotational step, uh, rotational no-till, <clears throat> the first step is to grow a high biomass cover crop, which would be a minimum of three tons per acre above ground biomass. Um, and these pictures are two examples of cover crops that are in the four to five ton per acre range. That on the left is a pearl millet and sun hep, which has actually been growing only for about uh, 65, 70 days and reached that biomass. On the right is triticale and uh, Austrian winter pea, which were grown over winter in Virginia. Um, so this first step is essential. You cannot do any kind of no-till in organic without a high biomass cover crop, and we'll see why pretty soon. What you do is you grow this cover crop, and then the cash crop is planted no-till into the cover crop, which has been uh, terminated with a roll crimper or by mowing or by winter killing. And then usually, the reason this is rotational no-till is that usually by the end of the cash crop harvest season, you have some weed pressure and at least some cover, uh, cash crop residues. You're going to need to do some degree of tillage in order to establish the next cover crop in the rotation. So the next step in rotational no-till is to terminate the cover crop without tillage or herbicides. On the left is a, uh, upper left is a uh, roll crimper that the Virginia um, Natural Resources Conservation Service um, lent out to farmers to try this technology. You can do a pretty decent job of rolling with a um, very heavy implement such as a, um, a flail mower with the power turned off. Now when the power is on, the flail mower uses a lot of fuel and it also leaves your um, material chopped finer so it doesn't suppress weeds quite as effectively. So, um, this is an example of kind of uh, jury rigging. It's not quite as effective as a roller uh, crimper, but it can work fairly well. Uh, the fourth uh, photo there, fourth example, is a, is a heavy cover crop of pearl millet, which is winter killed. And it is now left of residue uh, that is basically a mulch that you can use for early spring planting of, of uh, cash crops. Now, to go through there with a mechanical nodal transplanter would be a nightmare, but if that, co if that cover crop had been roll crimped right after the cold weather started stopped its growth, after the first frost, you would have um, a uh, much better oriented residue. <clears throat> okay, so the step three is to go ahead with a no-till planter. This is a, on the left is a subsurface sub tiller transplanter developed by Ron Morris at Virginia Tech. Um, and on the right is some organic summer squash that was planted into uh, roll crimped rye and vetch. Uh, that crop gave 15 tons per acre, which is just about average for conventional summer squash production. And you can see there's very few weeds there. Uh, now it's about mid-harvest. So the last step in rotational no-till is you are going to have some weeds. It's not like you're going to have a weed-free stand. Um, so you need to find some way to manage weeds that are uh, become a bit of a problem in your cash crop. Uh, on the right is a picture of some heavy-duty finger weeders, which are pretty good for taking out weeds in higher residue conditions. You could use sweet undercutters, or for very wide-spaced rows, you can actually just mow the inter-rows. Um, however, uh, I would not attempt organic no-till, rotational no-till, if you have any of the following weed problems. Uh, perennial weeds like nutsedge or Johnson grass, Canada thistle, uh, the bindweeds are among the worst. So you have any of those in any quantity, they will just come right through the mulch. Um, the nuts hedges will actually come through a black plastic mulch, too. They're really aggressive. If you have very high populations of annual weeds, like uh, there's an emergence of some uh, pigweed in, um, in the next picture, if your uh, annual weed population is very high, it can be difficult to do ro uh, rotational no-till successfully. Or if you have recently broken sod, the remnants of the sod will come up through that mulch like uh, very easily. So there's a few other challenges that uh, you need to address around rotational no-till. You've got to have the right equipment. Uh, you need to make sure your uh, cover crop is a sufficient uh, biomass and is very even. Like if you stand in the field and you look down on your cover crop and you're ready to roll crimp it, and you can see the soil surface, even in patches, it's probably not thick or even enough. 
And the further south you get, the more biomass you need to stop the vigorous uh, weed growth. But also, to some extent, the easier it is to grow higher biomass because you have a longer season. Um, you have to terminate it at the right time, which is somewhere between full bloom and the first formation of seed. You don't want mature seed to form viable seed. Um, but anytime full bloom, late bloom, and in the case of grains, when you ha in the very soft dough stage where the seed is starting to form but it's not viable, that's the right range. Uh, on the right there, when you've got a mix, the, the challenging thing is to make sure all the uh, components of the mix will mature synchronously so that they, you can roll crimp them together and not have one of them grow back or self-seed. Now, uh, there's another example of what happens around the timing. That last picture that showed that successful squash crop, the timing was perfect for rye and vetch. Barley and crimson clover roll crimped the exact same day resulted in a tremendous lawn of cover crop, which basically uh, choked out the squash. And in the lower left, is this an example of cover crops that are too young to, to roll crimp? They will grow right back because they're still vegetative. So a few other challenges, uh, the heavy cover crop residues can make it challenging to get good seed soil contact, especially when you're direct seeding. I would not recommend this technique at all for direct seeding small seeded crops. If you have large seeded crops or, or large propagules like potatoes, onion sets, uh, garlic, cloves, uh, beans, squash, uh, corn, those kind of larger propagules, if you have the right equipment um, to open that furrow, set the seed in good seed soil contact, and then close it, uh, it'll work. But very often, uh, one of the main causes for um, crop yield reductions in no-till is inadequate seed soil content in inter on thin stands. In this case, we didn't have that problem at all. This is pearl millet that was rolled down and then late snappings were quite successfully planted there. But you can see they don't look all that vigorous. They should almost have closed that, that canopy there and they're a little bit light colored. Um, the pearl millet likely either consumed moisture and or tied up some of the nitrogen since it is just a grass. There were no legumes there. Um, and these two challenges are the most frequent causes of um, limited success or reduced yield. And this is especially true further north. Uh, the further north you get, um, the uh, shorter the growing season and the harder it is to fit a full, mature, high biomass cover crop and a full season production crop to get full yield. So when is it most likely to succeed? Um, begin with warmer climates with adequate rainfall, which is the southeastern United States, the Gulf Coast states, Hawaii. A lot of these areas have had uh, studies on organic no-till where sites in these locations showed uh, organic, I mean, no-till yields of vegetable and grain crops similar to the same crops grown with conventional tillage in an organic system. And that's partly because you have a longer growing season and the warmer temperatures so that instead of slowing down nitrogen uh, mineralization so that the, the crop doesn't get enough, um, sometimes a no-till basically slows it down so that it's better synchronized, especially on lighter textured sandy soils. Also, if your soil is well aggregated, it's just a good healthy soil, it's rich in organic matter, you have good, organic, uh, you have good uh, structure, that'll tend to promote success with these systems. And here's one specific example where the nitrogen tie-up by the cover crop can become an advantage you take a really strong nitrogen fixer like soybean or, or cowpea or perhaps lima bean, which are much more um, self-sufficient for nitrogen than uh, regular snap beans. Um, roll down rye, uh, rye cover crop or another winter cereal grain, plant the soybean no-till, and what happens is the rye ties up nitrogen and suppresses a lot of weeds, especially those that respond to nitrogen. And meanwhile, the crop comes on and grows normally because it's fixing all the nitrogen it needs and uh, the rye on the surface is really not going to interfere with uptake of other nutrients and it's going to help conserve moisture. Um, now when you get very far north, when you get into the, uh, the really crunch of the short growing season, even soybeans can show some decrease in yield with the organic no-till. Uh, but they are much more likely to succeed than for instance uh, field corn, which is a heavy nitrogen feeder. So here's a few tips to make it work better, to increase your chances of success. First I'd say when in doubt, Start small, try it on a small area experimentally, see if it's going to work in your, for your system, and then uh, try it at a larger scale. Sometimes if you have a cover crop that's a little tough to terminate, 
or you're not quite sure, you can just run the roll crimper over there again. It's not a huge amount of fuel that you're going to use for that. And uh, it can really make the difference between uh, growing back and uh, laying down pretty well. This is a, can be important for when you have a rye vetch mixture or rye in uh, Austrian peas. The legume being kind of viney and maybe a little bit later to mature will tend to pop back up. And then a quick second pass right before you plant will help deal with that. There are row cleaners and different culture types that can improve seed soil content. Uh, there's many. Um, I am not a, an equipment person, so I would not be able to give you details on this, but I know that there's always making advances in equipment for uh, no-till planting. Uh, simply adding weight to the toolbar to, uh, to make sure that your planting shoe gets down in the soil and doesn't get hung up in the residue can help. Um, you can also choose cover crop varieties that are easy to roll crimp or that mature a little earlier. Like if you want to go rye and crimson, grow a brussy rye, which matures three weeks earlier than most kinds of rye, and will be synchronized with the uh, clover. Uh, one grower in uh, Tennessee, organic grower, found that purple bounty vetch is easier to roll crimp. Another thing that the SARI cover crop surveys show an increasing number of people trying is called planting green. That's you seed the cover crop into the, you seed the cash crop into standing cover, and then you roll crimp. And in fact, uh, uh, Dr. Ron Morris at Virginia Tech did this experimentally with potatoes. And this is in a field where he preformed the raised beds in the fall before planting the rye and veg. Then when the rye and veg was about two or three feet high and not ready to roll crimp, uh, he went through with a no-till planter and dropped um, potato seed, seed potatoes, in double rows, let the cover crop grow until the potato was just emerging, at which point the cover crop was in late flower to early, uh, uh, early dough seed set. Came through and either mowed it or roll crimped it, and you got a nice sand of potatoes. Uh, this system, he found the yield increases of about 17% because the mulch favored uh, potato tuber formation by keeping the soil cooler. Okay, another thing you can do is use an opaque tarp or landscape fabric on top of a rolled cover. Um, just for a couple of weeks before planting the cash crop, and this ensures cover crop kill and it really suppresses weeds. You get a longer weed-free period. Um, and a no-till with tarp, uh, squash and cabbage yields up in New York, and uh, I think it was one of the New England states. There was a study done up there. Um, the yields were greater than or equal to tilled organic and definitely greater than no-till without the tarp. A uh, grower here in Virginia, uh, his name is Anthony Flacavento, uh, both a grower and a consultant. Um, he um, used clear plastic after terminating a mature stand of summer cover crop of being pearl mill and cowpea just for two days. And in the summer heat, that just killed everything in the way of you know uh, plant crowns and weeds and everything. And then he planted broccoli, and he got maximum broccoli yield without adding nitrogen, which is very unusual. It's a very high, very heavy feeding crop. Okay, so um, a lot of details that you have to get exactly right. With uh, You have to have the stars line up for you, and you have to be really skilled. But the good news is that we need to put no-till in perspective. It's not the only way to build soil health. Uh, continuous no-till in and of itself has been shown in uh, studies – uh, to add about 900 pounds, maybe half a ton of organic matter per acre per year. And this goes on for about 10 or 15 years, and then that tends to plateau. And the downside is that most of this organic matter accrued through no-till itself accumulates near the surface, and it's just physically protected in aggregates. And even a continuous no-till farmer, if there are a few perennial weeds breaking through, which will happen after a few years, um, the strictest no-till farmers will till once or twice a decade, maybe th maybe every even every three years. That one tillage will pretty much lose a lot of the organic matter that has been protected in aggregates from the no-till by itself. The good news is that when you improve your whole rotation by including deep-rooted crops, by including sod crops, by just adding cover crops to a corn-soy rotation or even a corn-soy-wheat rotation, um, increasing the days per year under living cover, increasing the depth and biomass of the roots, and then using some organic amendments, just using basically good integrated organic practices and tilling with, some, with care, doing some tillage, you can add as much or more organic matter that way. And a good amount of that organic matter is deeper in the soil profile and it is um,
stabilized through methods that are uh, th through mechanisms that are not as easy disrupted by one pass with a cultivator. So um, let's look at some other ways that you can just reduce tillage. And first, I want to just quickly touch on the NRCS four principles of soil health, which um, I like more and more because the more I have, more research I review, the more thoroughly um, the emerging findings validate these four principles. One is keep the soil covered as much as practical. Um, not only stops erosion, uh, which blows away a lot of organic matter, but it just slows the oxidation of organic matter by the sun beating on the soil. Maximize those living roots. And of course, uh, living top growth biomass, all that grow, uh, top growth, anything that's not harvested, it goes back to the soil too. But it's the roots that really feed the, the soil life. And you energize the system with crop diversity. And that could be either through crop rotation or intercropping. You can do it with multi-species cover crops, and those can be challenging to manage. So you can also just do a single species at any one time or just a two-species cover crop. But mix it up. You know, you do rye and vetch this winter. You do barley crimson next winter. Uh, the next year, you're growing a winter cash crop like uh, garlic or, you know, a cereal grain that you're going to harvest, and you go into summer cover crops. Um, so you can build a diversity either in time or in space. And then when you do crop livestock integrated systems, you build a whole other layer of diversity. And uh, when you uh, mob graze and have good rotational grazing practices that further benefit soil life and soil health. And then minimizing soil disturbance. This is the, this is the challenge for all conservation-minded farmers because if you're going to go organic, you've got to do some physical to, uh, disturbance. You're going to till once in a while if you're going to grow cover crop, if you're going to grow uh, annual crops. If you're going to do it non-organically, conventionally with continuous no-till, you've got to get out that herbicide once in a while to knock those weeds back. And you're going to maybe need a few soluble fertilizer applications uh, if you're not doing an organic system. So, uh, but either way, uh, either approach, and today we're focusing on the organic approach, um, can really build soil health. And I, and I think the evidence is that organic systems are very effective. Okay. Um, I seem to be missing the image here, organic. Uh, let's see what happened here. Okay, um, USDA Beltsful has been a long-term uh, farming systems trial comparing several organic rotations with conventional corn soy rotations, either with or without tillage, like the continuous no-till. And the uh, organic rotations used a moderate amount of poultry litter and uh, high biomass cover crops. And the organic matter was measured from the surface to 39 inches. So we're not getting um, results biased towards the surface. We're looking at the whole soil profile, which is really important in the long term. The organic rotations accrued about two and a half times as much organic matter over that 13-year period as conventional no-till. The bottom line is that these integrated organic systems uh, can really uh, build as much or more organic matter than the conventional continuous no-till. Uh, and because a lot of it is deeper in the soil profile and because you've really eliminated the chemical disturbance, you do tend to build a more complete soil food web. Okay, so there's a few ways we can approach soil-friendly tillage practices. Um, is there a ways to reduce the amount of, of, of the frequency of tillage? How many passes you make through the field? Just ask yourself, do I really need to till this field right now? And we'll get to a good example of that a little later. Um, or you can till, till shallowly. If you can deal, if you got, say you got some crop residues left over from your harvest, and you have a few small weeds popping up, or maybe many small weeds, but they're small, okay? You don't have to till six inches deep. You might go through there with a rotary howl, run it two inches deep. You've got a seed bed. You go out there, throw your fall cover crop down, and uh, that's all you need. Um, think non-inversion. Uh, think of inversion tillage as turning the house upside down. And sometimes you can till just as deeply without doing that. Um, and this is another thing. There's one farmer out here in Virginia um, uh, by the name of uh, uh, Rick Felder, I think. I can't remember. Sorry. <laughs> but anyway, uh, he has a place called Madame Bowman Creek Farms, and he just found a way to ease up on his rototiller uh, just on, on how quickly it turns, and he's re resulted in tillage that doesn't pulverize the soil. 
Strip tillage and ridge tillage, we're going to go into that in a little more detail in a bit, but that is a way to leave the inner row spaces undisturbed. And then let cover crops do some of the tillage. And then that sod phase and the rotation, that gives the land that, that vital rest. Um, uh, there's one farm in, in, um, in Kentucky that has integrated crops and livestock, and after three years of intensive vegetable cropping, you just put some seeds and perennials and let the livestock graze it rotationally for four or five years and really restores the soil health. So, okay, here's this question. Can you till less often? Now, that really fine seedbed on the left, um, that's great for growing some, something like carrots or parsnips or onions or spinach where you're direct seeding these really small seeds with delicate seedlings. Uh, they need a seed bed like that and they need fairly firm seed soil contact. Um, but if you're planting potatoes or you're setting out tomatoes, you don't need such a fine seed, but it's okay if it's a little lumpy. Uh, so you don't have to beat the soil as often. You can actually save that last finishing pass. And you're growing a summer cover crop and along comes Jack Frost, kills it out, let it be. Or if you want to try to no-till in the spring, you might want to roll crimp that cover crop, but don't run out there and till it in the fall because when you let that stand, you're – allowing the, the ground beetles to eat a lot of the weed seeds, if any weeds came up in there. <laughs> um, the ground beetles are out there cleaning up the weed seeds. And in addition, it's much kinder to the soil. And it also um, has some of the even shown to get better yields just by leaving that in place until shortly before you need to plant. So integrated weed management, I mentioned that just combining good crop rotation, competitive crops, cover crops, mulching, mowing, and flaming. Um, we do have a, a soil health guide on that and also a webinar that's been uh, archived on eOrganic. On the right, the straw mulch was spread after one or two cultivations on those peppers and eggplants. And with those plants that well established and the weeds just barely beginning to come through, you probably don't need to do any more cultivation. And in fact, it would be kind of difficult with the mulch, but you now have the soil protected and you've reduced the uh, uh, cultivation passes. There has been a, a found to be a good synergism between simply reducing the depth of tillage and using good organic integrated practices in enhancing soil life and enhancing um, soil organic matter, both microbial biomass and total and active soil organic matter. This is a study in, in uh, Germany, a long-term trial, uh, where their t minimum tillage is defined as three inches. And here's a uh, farmer. Now, that field has been tilled once, but the second pass, uh, he set that tiller to go just one inch deep. And in one pass, he is planting cover crop seeds and now knocking out the tiny weeds that have come up since the previous pass. Here we go. Okay, so here's one of the newer implements that's available for doing shallow tillage. This is called a power harrow. This is an attachment for a BCS two-wheel tractor. Um, now, power harrows uh, implements designed to work the soil shallowly, but without the intensive rotary tillage of a standard rototiller. There are other such implements that have been designed to, uh, for large-scale tractors to go with a, uh, as much as a 30-foot-wide uh, uh, swath. But this is very handy for market gardeners and small-scale farmers who have a permanent raised bed system, and you're just going over the bed, the bed top working shallowly to create a seed bed. And there's another way to, uh, to terminate cover crops that um, is not as risky as no-till in that it, it does allow you to undercut the cover crop and any weeds that are coming up with it. It's called a sweet plow undercutter. It's like broad duck feet. And they just go along an inch or two below the surface and basically skim off the root crowns and lay the cover crop down, leaving a lot of residue on the surface. And studies in Nebraska found that that... Um, is leaves the soil in much better physical condition and sometimes improves yields compared to disking the cover crop. Okay, um, and also sometimes you do need to till deep. Um, there's a hard pan that's forming. Some soils have a natural tendency, especially in the southeastern United States, to form a hard pan underneath the top soil layer. And um, on a, again, I'm talking about a garden scale here. The broad fork is really handy for that. You can use it to loosen the soil to pull crops like, uh, you know, root crops. Uh, uh, loosens the soil, uh, prepares a seed bed without um, inverting or um, severely pulverizing the soil. Now, at a farm scale, a chisel plow is the most common implement. And 
Uh, there's a meta-analysis of different tillage practices, uh, studies of different tillage practices found that the chisel plow does indeed allow higher microbial biomass, which is an indicator of soil health, than a moldboard plow or plow disc. Okay, I'm not getting this advancing. Uh, quick to gain control. Okay, there we go. Thank you. Um, so uh, here we have um, another form of deep non-inversion tillage. This is a rotary, a reciprocating spader. Uh, it's an excellent primary tillage for smaller scale operations. It is a very slow process. You're going to move into the field about one mile per hour with about a five foot wide working uh, implements. It's not something you're going to do on a 100 acre uh, grain farm most likely. Uh, but the nice thing about this spader is it works the soil deeply without inverting it and without pulverizing it. Now in the, in the photo, this is an example of non-optimum conditions. They were in the middle of the drought. Uh, so you are getting some of that same wind erosion we saw in that early photograph. There's some dust coming up behind the machine. But when you consider that he actually went into sod like you see to the left of the till bed, and just ran that two passes and completely incorporated that and created a little dust, yes, because it's too dry. Uh, you can imagine how thoroughly and easily and gently that would have worked at optimal soil moisture. So this is excellent for at the end of a sod crop in a rotation or incorporating any high biomass cover crop. You probably want to go out and mow it first and then you can spade it in. Trials in the Pacific Northwest showed that using the spader to prepare seed beds significantly reduced compaction and sometimes it improved vegetable yields. Not every year, but the trend was that about 20% oh, of the time you had a significant improvement in vegetable yield because the compaction was, on those years, um, constraining the, um, the yield. Okay, let's see if that works. All right, good. All right, so this is, um, yeah, Rick Felker, that's his name. Uh, Manawoman Creek Farm, uh, he found a way to use his rototiller. It doesn't beat the heck out of the soil. You actually speed up the tractor forward speed. The, uh, most farmers, they'll drive about one mile an hour, similar to the spader, and run the tiller four to six inches deep and run it at a full speed. You want, you know, and, and the idea is that you create this really fine seed bed. But very often, you don't need it quite so fine. And as your tractor is moving twice as fast, three times as fast, and you've geared the rototiller down, You've reduced the pulverizing impact about five or six fold. And um, this farmer has found that by using the rototiller in this way, in combination with high biomass cover crops and permanent raised beds where uh, traffic control, the wheels are always in those alleys, and uh, adding compost according to uh, uh, soil test reports, basically good organic management and using the rototiller in this fashion even though his soil is very sandy, is out on the out on the eastern shore of Virginia, where they have a lot of loamy sand soils, um, he could see visible crumb structure, and that's quite an achievement on a soil like that. So uh, you don't necessarily have to go out and buy an expensive spader or or um, try the no-till with a roll crimper in order to really ease up on your soil. Another great way to do work this is to till any part of the field, do the strips, um, and there's some really good strip tiller. Um, systems where there's an initial culture that opens the slot and then a deep shank that'll kind of loosen the soil and then those little rolling baskets that just basically turn the clotty surface into a nice seed bed. You can either direct sow or transplant. Uh, and there's some peanuts uh, growing uh, in a strip-tilled field. I'm not sure if that is an organic example or not, but the one on the left is, is uh, an example of an organic application. <clears throat> So here's a, a field that was, uh, soybeans were planted after ridge tilling corn residues. Now what's happened here is this is this was not actually cover crop. So this does not look like the most well cared for soil that you're gonna run into. And it's true, it was not. But at least the farmer left the corn residues on the surface over winter and then ridge tilled. And it's a form of strip tillage uh, where you have your, your, your uh, field is in, in ridges, like narrow beds. And then in the spring, tillage consists of skimming off the residues of the, on the top of the ridge and removing 
Uh, just stirring the soil shallowly again, uh, like like harrowing the soil just a couple of inches deep, so you have a seed bed. You plant in that, and then once that crop is well established, maybe three weeks after this picture, you go through again, and there'll be some weeds coming up, and you'll cultivate the inter-row weeds with a high residue cultivator, and that'll tend to throw residues back into the crop row. So you're concentrating organic matter in the row, and the whole field gets a very light amount of tillage. The uh, ridge top at the beginning of the season and the inter-row inter area um, later in the season. And uh, there were some researchers um, in the Midwest. Uh, there was a, a, a research team that looked more closely at ridge tillage from the vo viewpoint of what they call a soil functional zone management, and um, this was uh, a study they did about five different sites, and they found that what happens is you're stimulating the uh, breakdown of organic matter and the release of crop nutrients just right in the crop row. So you're getting more mineralization there where you want the nutrients, and then you're allowing the soil to remain undisturbed between the rows so you can continue to have stabilization of organic matter. That's why they call it soil functional zones. So you want the crop right where the crop is growing to be fast releasing nutrients to get the crop off to a running start. And you want the rest of the field to be conserving organic matter and building soil structure. And they also observed that when you rebuild the ridge later on, you're moving more fertility into the rows. And it's now getting into the summer where the soil life is more effective at um, uh, mineralizing organic matter, uh, uh, processing organic matter, both converting it into uh, residues into stable organic matter and also we're continuing to release nutrients and uh, also the crop itself is larger so its roots are exporting a much greater volume so they don't need that to be spoon fed that rapid release that you get right after creating the uh, doing the ridge till another way to do soil functional zone management is to zone plant your cover crops like right here you see sorghum sudan grass in the alleys um, which is a very heavy duty nitrogen immobilizing grass, very suppressive to weeds, very high biomass. And then in the row, you have a legume. In this case, it's sun hemp. So it's fixing nitrogen and leaving residues that are more easily broken down. So one could go through here, um, roll crimp the whole cover crop and perhaps shallow till that uh, sun hemp. And then you have the grow zone. Uh, this, in this case, it's a whole bed top and not just a single narrow row. Um, but you have that whole area where you're um, you're stimulating the release of nitrogen because you grew a legume in the first place, and perhaps you've tilled it a bit for preparation for planting your main crop. And here you might put in two or three rows of a vegetable crop like uh, cabbage or lettuce, you know, fall fall vegetables. Um, and there's been some interesting research. Uh, there's a new project uh, funded by. Um, the Organic Research and Extension Initiative, in which they're planting a, just a single or double row of tillage radish right down the future crop row. And that's a crop, although it doesn't fix nitrogen, it's uh, very succulent, breaks down quickly, and it releases the nutrients that's scavenged and leaves very little residue. And then you can have the rest of the field in rye or rye and vetch or something that's uh, going to be slower to mineralize and will hold down the weeds. Um, okay. So another thing to do to reduce the amount of tillage you have to do um, mechanically is to grow cover crops that do it. We know that uh, uh, tillage radish is one that's been uh, become very popular lately because it's really proven itself in multiple studies. Uh, biennial sweet clover is one uh, that you need a, almost a year to grow that one and get it uh, effective, but it's a heavy mass of taproot and it's a nitrogen fixer. Um, pearl millet and uh, sorghum sudan grass both have very deep root systems. All of these can go to six feet or deeper. Now the winter rye is not quite as uh, deep or heavy a subsoiler, but it was shown to be quite effective in a study in South Carolina, again on some of these soils that tend to compact naturally at about uh, 12 to 18 inches below the surface. The rye sent enough roots into that deeper soil profile late in the season when there was soil moisture um, so that it could then loosen the soil. And then uh, when they went to plant cotton the next year, they did not need tillage to break that hard pan. They could still get a full yield. 
whereas without a cover crop, they needed a heavy subsoiling in order to get the cotton roots down deep enough so that the cotton got enough uh, moisture and nutrients. So one thing to remember is that in any uh, soil health sustainable organic management system, cover crops are fundamental. Very, every study that showed positive trends in organic systems with tillage, uh, the crop rotations were tight so that you didn't have any extended bare fallow, uh, and cover crops played a central role. Now, one caveat on that uh, tight rotation was no fallow. If you're dealing with a very low rainfall environment, like uh, the interior northwest or the western parts of the Great Plains, um, you will need to reduce the amount of biomass you try to grow per year, uh, and there are some issues with cover crops consuming soil moisture. However, the traditional wheat fallow two-year rotation, where you grow one wheat crop every two years and the rest of the time is bare fallow, Soil quality declines even under continuous no-till, whereas simply adding one cover crop of any, uh, usually like a winter legume, just adding one cover crop in that off year so that the fallow includes some plant growth, then with minimum tillage, you are able to maintain and build organic matter and overall soil health. So this is the perennial sod phase. I mentioned that before. Uh, this is an example. This is actually from my home community garden. Uh, we've been growing vegetables for several years. and it was getting kind of weedy. And one year, um, we grew some uh, hullless oats for eating and cut the oats. And we've sowed, I can't remember that red clover was sowed with the oats or it was overseeded into the uh, growing grain. But after harvest, it became a carpet of red clover. And we let that be there for a year. Um, ideally would be a clover grass mixture. It's more balanced to have legume and grass together. Uh, but multiple studies have shown pretty consistently that when you rest the soil for at least one and preferably two or three years under uh, some form of perennial sod, um, you restore soil health because you have continuous living roots, you have no tillage, and you have increased plant diversity. You're rebuilding fertility in terms of the soil's capacity to release nitrogen and the any loss in soil structure or soil tilth from repeated tillage under a vegetable rotation is quite substantially restored by a couple of years of, of this kind of cover. And then of course, in an integrated crop livestock system, you can graze it as pasture. And when, it's, uh, when the grazing is managed well, that will further enhance the soil's recovery uh, from the uh, years until crops. Another thing that happens during this phase is that ground beetles and other uh, weed seed consumers are out there cleaning up the perennial, the annual weed seeds and uh, that have accumulated during uh, intensive production. So it's also good weed control and that in turn re allows you to reduce tillage further. Oh, here's the crop livestock in, uh, integration example. This is excellent. Elmwood Stock Farm, um, Max Stone and Ann Bell, uh, John Bell. It's a family farm. Uh, they have several hundred acres. Some of them are relatively sloping, and they just keep them in permanent pasture. Some of them are more level or just very slightly uh, rolling. And they have them in a rotation of three years of intensive vegetables with winter cover crops. You've got a tight rotation, but lots of tillage, including one turn plowing, actually. That they actually mold board plow at the beginning to break the sod. Um, and then after that third year, they go back into uh, grass legume sod and they, and they uh, rotationally graze it, intensively rotationally graze with multiple species. They have cattle and sheep, and they also have uh, poultry and I believe a few hogs. But they, anyway, they, they have this um, grazing system. And there was a University of Kentucky soil health study where they're measuring several parameters of soil health. And in year four of the rotation, which is just after one year of pasture, after the three years of intensive vegetables, the soil organic matter, the or available organic nitrogen, and the microbial activity was described as approaching the levels in his permanent pasture. Uh, so that was, that's quite an exciting breakthrough when it comes to um, having soil health and tillage be compatible with one another. If you've got the space and you have the skills uh, when you have an extended family farm like that, uh, some family members took on managing the livestock and some take on managing the vegetables and others manage the uh, CSA for distributing products. So it's very much a team effort, but it's a 
a really an excellent uh, model for sustainability and uh, for reducing tillage without having to go to try to go no till. Um, after the initial efforts to prepare this webinar, uh, we came across, in fact, it was Alice, uh, came across this excellent uh, resource. It's a 300-page program handbook from a reduced tillage uh, or in organic systems field day that Cornell University held just at the end of July this year. Um, and here's just a couple of pictures from it showing one of the roller crimpers laying down a rye cover crop and uh, some soybeans. This is actually pictures from Virginia. The Virginia uh, State Office of NRCS shared these. And uh, this resource has excellent information on both organic no-till, uh, different roll crimper designs, different uh, methods of, of managing the cover crop, uh, troubleshooting, like sometimes a roll crimper doesn't kill it completely, or uh, other problems arise, and they have lots of information on, on, on dealing with those issues. As I said, I'm not a, an equipment person. I've never driven a tractor. Uh, they also have a, an excellent section on zone tillage, um, and that's a that's a, just another term for strip tillage. They work up about a third of the field, uh, work up the, the the crop rows, and they had a, a very effective um, system uh, that I mentioned earlier. It was an opening coulter, a heavy duty coulter that, that cuts through the residue, a shank that goes about a foot deep into the soil, breaks any hard pan, um, and then uh, some uh, another pair of coolers that actually create a little tiny ridge, like a slightly raised ridge, so, and then that little rolling basket that you saw in an earlier picture behind it. And that sequence just leaves these perfectly prepared strips and three quarters of the field just um, in undisturbed rolled or frost killed cover crops. Uh, just a, an excellent resource for anyone who would like to explore alternative ways to reduce tillage in organic systems. Okay, these are um, some of the soil health guides, and the one on tillage is uh, upper center there. And uh, so there's ones on cover crops, which complement this uh, the tillage uh, topic very uh, closely, and also the weeds. Uh, this one will t uh, tell you more about integrated weed management. Uh, excuse me, that's not the weeds. This is it over here. Um, so anyway, uh, the one on weeds will... Uh, discuss ecological integrated weed management, uh, ways that will allow you to keep the weeds down with nearly as many cultivation passes. Um, and I think we are ready for questions. Thank you for your time and attention. And I'll hand it back over to Alice. So um, we do have some questions coming in, and we don't have that many in the queue. So um, if you have a question, there's a good chance that you'll get yours answered. So um, first question. Um, do roots still live when an annual cover crop dies due to frost kill? No, but an annual crop usually when it finishes its life cycle or is killed by frost, the roots die, but certainly the soil microbial community associated with the root remains very much alive and active and engaged. Uh, and it's that undisturbed soil profile with root residues breaking down that will build soil health. Uh, even though the living root uh, exudate is no longer there, you, you definitely have the benefit of all that organic uh, residue uh, decomposing in place. And this is also why as soon as the weather is, is warm enough to get something growing again, you always want living plants growing as much as possible. Okay. Um, we have um, a question about bindweed, which is a very challenging weed. Do you have any advice for dealing with bindweed after it has been established in rows? Ah, this is a question I need to research before I do the Western Region Weed Webinar. Um, we have uh, bindweed's kid brother here, uh, I call it, because it is hedge bindweed. Not quite as deep-rooted, but still a very noxious weed. We have not figured out how to, how to work with it. Uh, I know that there are some studies on a, uh, a biocontrol, an insect that feeds on bindweed. Yeah, uh, although that's still in its beginning stages here, so um, yeah. yeah. You're talking about field bindweed, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, 
oh, what would I do? I mean, with, with limited moisture, it's not as easy to say, oh, just go choke it out with a cover crop. I mean, if I saw that stuff around here, I would just just throw everything at it. I'd make a mixture of um, sorghum sedan, pearl millet, buckwheat, cowpea, sunflower, just all the high biomass cover crops that I could throw at it. And then you grow it up. And you get the you get the uh, the grass is about three four feet tall. And before they head out, you mow the whole thing down. The grasses grow back like mad, and their roots get denser and deeper. That's a really cool thing about sorghum sudan, uh, all of the sorghums, and uh, also pearl millet. That there's a physiological response if you cut it back and leave about a six inch stubble height, and then let it grow back, let it tiller out and grow back. It sends its roots way down. And in the case of Canada thistle, which is another very, very stubborn perennial weed with roots down to 20 feet, they have found that doing this uh, sorghum sudan with a repeated cut, you cut it just as the Canada thistle and the sorghum sudan are getting tall. And the sorghum sudan is very allelopathic, very suppressive towards the, the uh, uh, Canada thistle and will choke it out. Actually, you get a 90% reduction the following year. Now, I don't know whether this will work with bindweed. Uh, we may need to find other cover crops that are particularly suppressive toward it. Um, and again, uh, most of my experiences is in the 40 to 50 inch uh, rainfall zone of the eastern United States. So uh, I frankly have a lot to learn about semi-arid agriculture, and that is probably one of the toughest challenges out there. So uh, sorry, I couldn't be more helpful. Okay. Well, let's see. Do you have any thoughts about controlling slugs in conservation tillage operations? Ah, that is a good question, too. Uh, if you're at a fairly small scale, there is quite an effective organic, very low toxicity slug bait. It's called slug go. It's just iron phosphate, and apparently it's a form of iron phosphate that is very toxic to slugs and will reduce their populations. Um now, this will be most effective at a market garden scale. Again, you're not going to be uh, controlling 100 acres of slugs with this material. You go broke, you know, especially when you're growing a low-value crop like corn or wheat. Um, I have heard that slugs can be a serious problem with conservation tillage. If you go to strip till, um, or you may have to go to a shallow tillage system where you do leave an exposed seed bed so you don't have that slug habitat. Um, and you do run into trade-offs like this. It's not as good for the soil to leave it bare, even shallow tilled, as it is to leave most of the soil covered with uh, with dead cover crops or or uh, mulch or some things like that. Um, I'm trying to think what else. Uh, did the did the uh, person asking did did they ask did they say what crops they were dealing with? Um. They didn't say. Um, okay. They can, we'll, we'll come back to it if they do put that in. Okay. Um, let's see. How about in cutting and harvesting the cover crop for thermal composting, then returning the compost to the same or a different field? Uh, that is an approach that I recommend on small scale, especially garden scale, because when you're bringing materials in, compost or mulch from off-site and using them intensively, you can build up nutrient imbalances. Uh, I myself will build up a potassium excess. And many, many growers have had problems with the phosphorus excess from compost. But if most of your compost material comes from cover crops you have cut out of the field, then you're just recycling nutrients. The only nutrients you're adding are, are nitrogen and the organic carbon because the, the plants, uh, the cover crop is fixing those. But any potassium or phosphorus that is, or micronutrients that are in that cover crop are just taken from the soil. So you're then taking it back to the soil. Um, yeah, that is one good way to do it. Like if you have a slug-prone crop and you've grown a cover crop, uh, you could take the top off, use that to mulch an established crop that has now escaped any slug pressure. You've got a tomato plant two or three feet, two or three feet high and getting close to setting its first fruit. You could mulch that crop with the cover crop. Or as the, uh, the uh, participants suggested, you can simply compost it. Now, just plant matter by itself may not compost as easily as it will with a little bit of manure, but if you did like four parts cover crop clippings and one part manure, you're then bringing in a small and probably uh, appropriate amount of nutrients and recycling most of it with the cover crop. So that is one really good approach. 
And then when you have just the stubble, you can shallow till it and you'll have a slug free seed bed for something uh, else that you might want to plant. Okay, great. Um, let's see, we have a question about whether there are any better soil or microbial tests and IPM, um, I guess weed IPM, to better predict success in no-till and conservation tillage systems. Uh, I'm sorry, what was the question again of how to predict success? Yeah, whether there are any soil or microbial tests that might predict success in no-till. Oh, test. And oh, okay. Yeah. Um, I can't think of any specifically, uh, but I would say that in general, the healthier and more biologically active your soil, the more likely you will be to be successful. Uh, because, and certainly the healthier your soil, the less tillage it will need for purposes such as creating a seed bed or taking out weeds. Like if you have good till and you have small weeds coming up, you won't have to cultivate as as rigorously, as intensively as you would if the soil was crusted and, and low in organic matter and, and it, soil health was, was lower. Also, the healthier your soil, the more it's releasing nutrients from its own reserves and the less likely you're going to have nutrient shortages from reducing tillage. Okay. Um, let's see. Is there a research resource site or book or notes on types of equipment and usage that you mentioned. Um, this person is new to this and finds the entire um, machine equipment um, part overwhelming. You and me both. And I would say that resource <laughs> that I mentioned about a couple of slides before the end, that, that uh, handbook, um, it's a treasure trove and it's got all kinds of links to other places. They give you more information on uh, specific implements uh, I would surf the web. Uh, another thing is go to a good conference, uh, like go to a Southern Saw conference or Eco Farm conference, any or Moses. Any of the big conferences will have a huge trade show, and there will be every possible kind of a, a piece of equipment. And since they're focusing on organic and sustainable, there'll be a lot of uh, new innovations uh, from walk behind tractor size up to 30 foot wide field tractor size. Uh, implement size uh, implements. So uh, that's a good place to start. Um, okay, great. Okay, um, what is the best way to bring sod pasture into vegetable production on a small scale, like half an acre to an acre, with as little equipment and effort as possible? That's the first part of the question, so I'll just leave it with that for the moment. Well, you could use, if you got heavy-duty silage tarps, or you could even use landscape fabric. Uh, I'd get a soil test, and if there's some specific nutrients that are short, you could put it in. You could put a little bit of uh, manure down, but mow it real close, and then just tarp it and let it break down uh, under the tarp. You're talking real small scale. Uh, another, uh, and I, I know one small-scale grower who was going into alfalfa grass sod, and he had, uh, it was an implement that attaches to a two-wheel tractor called a rotary plow. And it does kind of invert and mix the soil. It's, it, it's action is somewhere between the reciprocating spader and a standard moldboard plow. But the interesting thing is this fellow rotary plowed two of his small fields, or he had three half-acre small fields, and then ran out of time and energy and let the neighborhood uh, moldboard plow the third field. And the moldboard went too deep. It went down 14 inches. And as a result, you ended up with a subsoil at the surface. And meanwhile, the rotary plow did this beautiful job of mixing the alfalfa with the topsoil. And yeah, you have soil disturbance. You probably killed some fungi. You probably killed some earthworms. But you also created a burst of biological activity, converting all that nutritious sod into um, topsoil and organic matter. Uh, and it may be just as simple as going in there with the turn plow, but set it not too deep. You want it to go no deeper than six inches. You don't have to go way down to break sod. Uh, so that's another possibility. Get a neighbor uh, who is skilled with a plow and can just go pretty shallow. Uh, you could chisel plow and disc, but the disc is rather compacting if you can get hold of a spading machine. Of course, you said uh, limited equipment, but 
spading machine is probably the best. Um, but there are a number of ways you can do it. And I, and I think if you want to do a low-tech way and you've got a few months to wait for the sod to kill out, uh, just go ahead with, a, with some kind of opaque tarping or landscape fabric, which can be used over and over. Uh, so it's not something we're throwing away this uh, fossil fuel derived material after one use. Okay. Um, oh, somebody commented ducks for slugs. So uh, that obviously worked for him. So uh, thank you yeah. for that comment. Um, what are your thoughts on electro weed zapping through the plant to the root in relation to soil biology? I'm not sure I completely understand that, but um, do you have any Oh, is thoughts? this an electrical weed killer? Yeah. Yeah. That would be a fascinating subject of study. I would anticipate <laughs> only minor effects. I mean, it'll be a bit of a wake-up call for the for the rhizosphere of that particular weed, but I I don't imagine um you know, it's sort of like the question do cell phones cause cancer? Uh does Wi-Fi cause dementia? Things like that, you know, it's like um there is a lot of concern about out there about different forms of electric radiation and energy, and I think each one just needs to be looked at. Uh, so I don't really have an answer to that question, uh, but uh, I would suspect that there would be a measurable effect, but that it probably wouldn't be serious. Um, probably less serious than going in there with a uh, rototiller and tilling six inches deep to take the weeds out. Okay, um, somebody else commented with a link to a webinar um, that has to do with managing slugs and cover crops. So I just sent everyone the link that he just sent me. So thank you very much um, for that. Yeah, I have run into slugs as, a ma as an issue with organic no-till in the early days. I was doing some studies in the late 1990s, uh, actually early 1990s. Uh, uh, late 1980s, actually, and at New Alchemy Institute on Cape Cod with uh, Ralph De Gregorio, and we uh, that was one of the hurdles, one of the challenges was the slugs on vegetable crops, like setting out broccoli, and you had to go pick out the slugs. But this new slug bait, at least on a market garden scale, may be a really good tool. Okay. So um, let's see, there's a lot of questions coming in here. Okay, talking about maintaining soil health in organic systems where you have to till soil at some point, what soil right. properties are most likely to be deteriorated with tillage operations in soil which are high in organic matter and not sandy? Well, if they're high in organic matter, there may be more organic matter that's vulnerable to being oxidized by that tillage. Um, it's main, the main impact that tillage has is you're breaking apart the aggregates of the soil. And when you break aggregates, there's some, there was one fraction of organic matter that is physically protected in the aggregates. It's not chemically protected by being highly resistant to decay or adsorbed to soil mineral particles, uh, but is just present inside the aggregates and therefore breaking down more slowly than if it were exposed to the air and the elements. So it's, in fact, this, uh, there's a, a, a soil health benchmark study that the uh, Pennsylvania Association for Sustainable, Sustainable Agriculture is doing. They've got 27, 28 farms participating. And what they found is that, on the whole, the organic farms score very high on the Cornell Assessment for Soil Health. The two parameters where they don't score as high, one is uh, soil aggregation, and that kind of scores average. And that's related to the tillage. So you have some loss in aggregation, but the higher level of organic matter and soil health you start with, the less likely you're going to have a drastic loss of till. With, uh, if you're tilling with care, you're tilling judiciously, you're not overdoing it, uh, selecting your implements carefully, etc. cetera, uh, not doing it too, too often. Uh, all of these things will help uh, mitigate uh, that effect, but it is true that if you're stirring up the soil, uh, the other the other effect that the tillage will have physically is breaking apart uh, fungal filaments, and it's the long hyphal networks of fungi that really build some aspects of long-term soil health. So you do have a shift in the soil microbiome or soil food web as a result of tillage. Again, 
If you do things like use a rotary spader or a broad fork or you've uh, uh, modified your, your rotor tiller by slowing the rotary speed down and speeding your tractor up, so that you're leaving behind some of the aggregate, you haven't broken everything up, you're mitigating that impact. Uh, the other way in which soil, organic systems fall short on soil health is excessive phosphorus, and that's really a topic of a different webinar on nutrient management. Uh, but despite those weakness, those two weaknesses, overall, uh, biological activity, the balance of all other nutrients, uh, water holding capacity, uh, uh, absence of hard pan, the, the organic systems really shine. Okay. Um, I just want to mention to everyone also that our next webinar, which is going to take place on October 17th, is going to go into cover crops in even more depth. So Mark will be back talking about cover crops along with Diana Jerkins from the Organic Farming Research Foundation. Um, so I hope you can all attend that as well. Um, we have another comment um, related to mites and bindweed. Um, it says there are two different types of mites that will attack bindweed. One attacks the seed while the other one attacks the vegetation, and they've been mm. released together. But winter weather conditions will kill the populations if they are released too far north. Mm. So thanks for that comment. Yeah, that's very interesting. Yeah. Okay, so um, for chisel plowing to remove any panning, are there any research? Is there any research on how wide the passes should be to optimize reduction of the hard pan while maintaining the best soil structure in the top 18 inches? Oh, okay, 18 inches. We're talking subsoil. Most chisel plows will go down 10 to 14 inches. Um, I would say uh, the more I learn about cover crops, the more I would say. Uh, for deep hard pans biotill. <clears throat> uh, there have been studies that show that pearl millet, for instance, uh, will send its roots seven feet deep. Uh, it doesn't matter if the soil is super acid and loaded up with aluminum, if the subsoil is compacted all the heck, it'll go down six feet and go down there so thoroughly that it'll mop up any detectable nitrate. It'll basically deplete the soil profile of nitrate, which is a good thing to do when you're going into winter. You don't want to leach into the uh, drinking water and be wasted. So um, another one, of course, we know, we all know about tillage radish, and the big root looks like it only goes down 12 to 18 inches, but there is a fine but very robust tap root that will go down five feet. And again, uh, scavenge a lot of nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium through that whole profile and then it's held in this very succulent, rapidly decomposing top growth. So if you have a radish cover crop that's been terminated by winter or by tillage, and then you come in in the spring, plant a heavy feeding cover, uh, a cash crop right in that radish row, uh, it's, it's going to be spoon-fed a uh, good dose of nutrients. And meanwhile, uh, it'll break through that hard pan. And again, as I mentioned earlier, in this study in South Carolina where the hard pan, the subsurface hard pan was severe enough to uh, restrict cotton root growth depth and also a cotton access to moisture and therefore its yield. Growing just a simple winter rye cover crop of even moderate biomass, just one to two tons per acre, was enough uh, to restore, uh, to break through that hard pan and allow the cotton to grow almost as well as if it had been, had been uh, subsoiled, had the soil been subsoiled. Um, so I don't know. With the question, the original question was how far apart you want the chisels. Um, depending upon your crop, you know, you might just uh, if you're growing squash, let's say winter squash and rows eight feet apart, you just do one shank for each squash row. Uh, if you're getting to something like where you're planting a cereal grain, you might run them 30 inches apart. But I would say um, if you're going to mechanically subsoil immediately follow it with deep-rooted cover crops. Uh, the, probably the best would be to follow it with both a grass, which is uh, fibrous, like a rye in winter or sorghum sedan or millet in summer, and a legume, which tends to be, or a brassica, which tend to be more tap-rooted. So you have two different types of architecture of roots. So um, when you have a severe hard pan, that makes initial mechanical pass may be what you need, or if you're going to plant a long-lived perennial, some of this worth doing a single shank rip right down the row where you're going to put in your apple trees or your grapevines or your uh, blackberry bushes or whatever, uh, but then 
rely mostly on, on uh, biological approach with the cover crops. Okay. Um, let's see. Nitrogen management is a primary concern in organic cereal production in dry lands. Could yes. you suggest some um, nitrogen management strategies for organic wheat production in dry lands, given that cover cropping might reduce water availability? Well, uh, that's actually the subject of a later webinar. There'll be uh, one for the Western region this fall. Uh, that's actually a different series than this, but uh, it will be through eOrganic, uh, Western SARE. That's uh, October 24th, is that right? Something um, like that. I can check while you're yeah. answering. But I do remember one thing. Now, again, um, if I had time, I would just go out and do a year's internship in a, on a dry land farm in some semi arid region in the United States because I know a lot to learn about that system. But I do know there were at least two studies that showed a winter cover crop of field pea, either Austrian winter field pea or perhaps another line that's more adapted to the dry regions. You grow that on the alternate winter between your every two-year wheat crop. So you're going to add some nitrogen, and since it's a winter cover, it'll get the jump on the weeds, and it will also not steal so much moisture from the next winter's uh, wheat crop. Uh, but they have seen some success with that. They've also had, there's also been some success with actually interseeding a cover crop into the wheat after the wheat is established. <coughs> okay, let's see. Um, I was just trying to look up the date of that webinar. We haven't set those up yet, so um, uh, let's see. All right. Okay, I have a fallow field which I plan to plant with raised beds next spring in Vermont. And I need to initially till to establish the best, I mean, to establish the beds. Should I do that now in fall with a cover crop, or would it be better to wait until spring with oculation? Uh, occultation, that's using oh, occultation, the, yeah, that's using the silage tarps or the, uh, I would say in Vermont, you've got a, a short growing season, and it's barely time to plant cover crops now. What I would say is if you're going to grow summer vegetables, you're going to plant after the frost-free date, I would go out there this afternoon or tomorrow and plant rye and veg. And it should still establish and give you some growth. It won't grow very much this fall unless we have an unusually mild fall, uh, which is always possible with, with uh, the climate shifting the way it's been. But... Um, if you're going to grow early spring crops, um, I mean, if you do get a mild fall with, with not much frost until later on, uh, you could maybe just put on a high seeding rate of oats and it'll eventually winter kill and you'll have this fine mulch on the surface rather than bare soil, and then you get in early spring. Uh, if you need to hurry up the termination of the rye and veg cover crop, Mow it and then use the occultation, use the uh, either the silage tarps or the landscape fabric. On a small scale, I am getting more and more uh, enthused about that approach because uh, you're simply cutting off the light and terminating the cover crops and the weeds that way. You're not disturbing the soil. You're not disturbing the soil life, really. It's, it, it's there um, happily digesting the residues of whatever has been mowed and, and then uh, covered up. And then after a couple of weeks, you can pull it off, and you have this minimally disturbed uh, seed bed ready to go, and uh, several, at least a several weeks jump on the weeds. Uh, so I would recommend that, uh, that general approach. Okay. Um, let's see. We have time for another question or two here. Um, what's your best advice for breaking ground for a new farm on an old pasture or neglected land? Would you break it with a heavy plow and then cover crop before starting annual vegetable production? Uh, that is definitely one approach. Again, uh, use the plow with discretion. Find out how deep your topsoil is and don't go any deeper. I mean, uh, probably five or six inches to undercut is good enough. And you, remember, you don't need a really fine seedbed for a cover crop. In the far north, it's getting to be high time, almost too late to plant cover crops from about oh, Pennsylvania and the Missouri-Iowa border south, we got plenty of time to plant a cover crop. Uh, but again, go into the winter cover crop uh, after you've broken that sod. Uh, one thing that's good to do is to get a soil test uh, because when you break the sod and you're going to take a while before you get into the vegetables, you have some time to do things like correct uh, pH or 
there's a certain nutrient that's very low, you can get some manure in there. Uh, one thing that's really good for building soil quickly, um, if your nutrient levels are low, is to spread some some uh, manure, almost any livestock manure is good, um, and plant a cover crop, and they work together. But yeah, when, you, when you're breaking a sod, you will need to do primary tillage to prepare it for uh, vegetable production. One thing to consider if you're on a slope is you might work in strips and leave undisturbed contour buffer strips, like right on the contour. It's a practice in, uh, that NRCS uh, cost shares where you set up these strips, you, you cultivate 15 or 30 feet wide strip, and then you leave like a 10 or 15 foot wide, I think 15 feet is the minimum, uh, of undisturbed grass, and that'll, that'll check erosion pretty effectively. Okay, um, let's see, last question here. Um, do you have any suggestions on the best way of managing large amounts of Bermuda grass um, residue or residue Bermuda grass um, after a few years of no-till? Ah, you're going to probably have to till. But uh, if you're talking very small scale, I've seen it successfully solarized. <laughs> we went out there with uh, newsprint and, and, and covered it with oil to make it translucent, put it down. It was a friend of mine out in the coast of Virginia in the tidewater. And we lucked into a 105-degree day, and that fried that Bermuda grass a foot down, and then we put like a foot of straw on it. And it's kind of draconian. But when you get into medium large scale, what you got to do with Bermuda grass uh, realistically, I'd go in there and do a fairly vigorous tillage. Probably just take the rototiller, go ahead and chop it up pretty well to about six inches down, and then let it set. It's going to grow back. You're going to have a million sprouts. But the secret is every little fragment is drawing itself down until it's put out three leaves, and then it starts rebuilding. So let it get, let each little sprout get three leaves, till it again, and then plant one of those massive mixed species, high biomass cover crops, and uh, keep after it that way. Um, I mean, the same friend who's a very good farmer has been dealing with Bermuda grass for a long time. You get into annual veg of annual crops, uh, you can keep ahead of it. But if you're, if oh, this is a no-till system. You're not breaking sod. Uh, you will have to go into some tillage for a while. And the way I look at it is if you've got a till to uh, get a noxious weed under control, you just make it up with heavy cover crops because the cover crops will help with the weed control and it will help mitigate the adverse effects of the tillage. And, and if you really have heavy Bermuda grass where it's just, you know, dominating, you probably don't have that high level of soil health because you have a low diversity situation. So, as I say, knock it out with a till, hit it again at three leaves, Put a multi-species high biomass cover crop, uh, including sorghum sedan, and also include some very broadleaf uh, choking species like buckwheat or uh, cowpea. Uh, does this person say where they're located? He didn't. Okay. Well, if it's way far north, some of these um, very hot season cover crops may not be quite as effective. Uh, buckwheat is very good up there. Another one that's good is Japanese millet. You have to watch that it doesn't itself become a weed because it does seed pretty quickly. Um, but any of these uh, high biomass cover crops that will choke out the weeds will at the same time make up to at least some extent for the fact that you have to till. Bermuda grass okay. is the world's second most costly uh, agricultural weed, at least as of the late 20th century. So. Uh, it's a tough customer. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you, everyone, for all your questions. Um, I just wanted to remind everyone that the Organic Farming Research Foundation has produced some very good soil health guides, and they're available at the link on your screen. Everybody would get a copy of the slides. They are also already archived online. If you just Google Soil Health and Organic Farming Webinar Series, um, you should get a link to um, where we have Everything archived on extension.org, the first two webinars in the series, and also the link to register for our upcoming webinars. So as I mentioned, the next one is going into cover crops in more detail on October 17th. So we hope very much that you can join us for that. Thank you so much, Mark, who stepped in and sure. did the entire presentation when that was not initially planned. So great. <laughs> Mark, thank you so much again. Great to You're have welcome. you back. And um, thanks, everyone, for joining us.